Good morning, St. Francis in the fields, and welcome to our final class for how to read the Bible. And today we are going to talk about the Psalms. Um, last week I mentioned that we would be talking about the Psalms and the prophets, but I've decided to put off the prophets part of this talk, and uh, you'll hear more about our uh, direction with other Sunday school classes moving forward, but I do want to address the prophets at another point, along with a lot of other topics related to how to read the Bible. There's a lot we still haven't covered. Uh, we could spend years talking about this and still not exhaust uh, the topic of how to read the Bible. So uh, today, simply put, we are going to talk about the Psalms. Uh, but if you were with us last week, then you uh, will remember that, that we talked about uh, the use of uh, metaphor in biblical narrative. And uh, a metaphor was simply a figure of speech that highlights a similarity between two different things by stating that one thing is another. Now, this is an important distinction because often we think of metaphor as being equivalent to uh, fictional or, you know, it's rooted in the, the idea of a fairy tale. But metaphor is saying something about ultimate reality. Uh, metaphor um, is not simply the stuff of fairy tales. And all of that is to say that actually fairy tales, uh, you know, the genre of, of the imaginative in literature actually says something about ultimate reality too. I mean, think about uh, Lewis's writings or Tolkien's writings in either the Chronicles of Narnia or Lord of the Rings. And those, in many ways, are fantastical in their literary style, and yet they're speaking about ultimate reality. So I'm just trying to address the way in which we think of metaphor, that metaphor is somehow in opposition to literal meaning. We're going to talk a little, bit a little bit more about that as we move into our time together, but I simply wanted to flag that, and we'll get more into it here in a moment. A metaphor, again, is something that takes us from one shore to another. We uh, spoke about that um, idea uh, last week, that metaphors create an expanding web of associations, that we all draw upon metaphors daily uh, for um, understanding reality, for explicating what's going on in our lives and our hearts, for communicating what is going on in the depths of our experience and in moments of human love and sadness, loss and tragedy and joy. Uh, we use metaphors all the time. And so we talked as well about this phrase that Umberto Eco coined, uh, the phrase uh, encyclopedia of production. Another way of thinking about that would be that all of us have deep within us a kind of well that we drop our verbal bucket down into and we pull out metaphors that we then employ to speak to something about reality. And of course, the Bible does this too. It exists within a web of metaphorical associations. It existed, uh, you know, the Bible was formed within uh, a time, many times and places that were rooted uh, in ways, particular ways of talking about ultimate reality. And we talked about how not all metaphors are created equal. Uh, remember the metaphor that love is a trap or my mind is a computer or my emotions flared up, that these really, um, while maybe speaking to something true about reality, are not the best metaphors to use. And so I would just simply suggest that uh, perhaps we need to be given more to biblical metaphors. And in fact, the Western canon <laughs> of human language uh, is, is replete with metaphors from the Bible at points we don't even realize it. But let's be more intentional and thoughtful about the kind of language that we're using. So again, today we are talking about the Psalms. This will be our last class for the Virtual Rector's Forum. But the question that we want to start with is, simply put, what is a psalm? What is a psalm? So let me uh, paint a little picture for you of what a psalm is. A psalm 
is an opportunity to enter into the temple of God's presence. Uh, in fact, you'll see this in a moment. We'll play you the Bible Project video. And they conceive of the Psalms, the makers of that video, as a kind of virtual temple. Well, how appropriate for this moment where we are doing a lot of things virtually. But the Psalms are where an exiled people can go. The Psalms are a prayer book designed as a virtual temple to hear the entire story of God's people and to be trained in living, and this is key, living the fully human life with all of its attendant emotions, but to live the fully human life in the presence of God. Most simply, a psalm is a song or a poem. In fact, you could just plug in the term song for psalm. That is, in fact, what it means. But let me speak more about this idea of the psalms, the psalter, being a virtual temple that exiled people enter into. And in order to describe this, I need to step back a bit in the biblical narrative to talk about the concept of a temple. There is an Old Testament scholar named John Walton who has written quite a lot, but he speaks specifically about ancient cosmology, and then he looks at Genesis within the context of ancient cosmology. Of course, Genesis is making cosmological claims about ultimate reality, about the cosmos, about how it came into being, about how humans came into being, and all of creation and animals and more. So it is ancient cosmology, but it is Jewish ancient cosmology. And when John Walton talks about it, he is quick to highlight that in the ancient world, the, the original audience who would have heard the Genesis account would have understood precisely what was going on, that namely, when God creates for six days and then rests on the seventh, that that was all temple imagery. And again, let me just name that we have to seek to understand biblical literature in terms of how it would have been received both in the time that it was written and when it was interpreted and received by the original audience or audiences. So the original audiences would have understood, given their context, that when God creates for six days and then rests on the seventh, he is actually making a temple where heaven and earth overlap. Again, cue the Lord's Prayer. Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is rooted within that history. So God was creating, in, his, in essence, a temple in which he could dwell, he could rest with his people, with his creation. You might remember when the Israelites are going into the promised land, uh, there was a phrase that um, often came up either on the lips of God or his people that, uh, you know, you will not enter my rest. Um, this idea of entering into the rest of the Lord. This, this idea is, is uh, hearkening back to Genesis where God enters into his rest to enter into the land the promised land for the Israelites in that moment was a kind of recreation story to enter into the place where they could, they could dwell with God once again. And so when, when God creates in six days, he's forming a temple. Uh, the video we'll watch in just a moment will highlight that. But when he rests, it's not like God is taking a divine nap. Or something along those lines. It is, and this is the analogy that John Walton, the Old Testament scholar, uses. It is similar to how when the President of the United States is elected, he enters into the Oval Office and begins doing the work of running the country. So when you've gone through the campaign trail and then you are elected, it's not as if you just go down into the, the Lincoln bedroom and take a nap. 
No, you enter into the work. The, the, the work, really, of running the country has begun at that point. By analogy, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's a good analogy. God creates for six days. He's creating a temple in which both he and his creation dwells together. The seventh day he rests, and that is God entering into the fullness of ruling the cosmos after having breathed it into existence in the first place. So, the Psalms, to get back to the Psalms, are a literary creation written by, uh, in large part, David, but also others, to be a sort of literary virtual temple that whether you were in the promised land or uh, in the presence of the temple or you are in Babylon or elsewhere, you can enter into the presence of the Lord with the fullness of who you are, with your joy and your gladness and your praise, but also with your sadness, with the tragedy that has just occurred, with your broken heart, with all of who you are. And this is instructive for us. Very often when things go wrong in our lives, we feel that church is the last place we want to go. God does not desire for us to conceal things from him. In fact, it is impossible to do so. He knows our hearts more deeply than we know them. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so part of what prayer is, and part of what the Psalms provide, is a kind of tutor for us for how to feel fully human, both in our anger and in our joy, but how to feel those things in the presence of God, laying them, our emotions and our experiences at his feet so that he might, he might dwell with them, he might redeem them, he might use them for his purposes. So that's what I mean when I say that the Psalms are a kind of virtual temple. No matter where you are, you can enter into them. And that is, again, especially good news for us now who are in many ways isolated one from another and also from our church building. So let's watch the video. Um, many of these same themes will come up as the authors of the Bible Project talk about the Psalms. But again, feel free to take notes and um, think about what sticks out to you as you watch the video, and uh, then we will unpack it a bit more. We've been talking about poetry in the Bible, how biblical poets love design and masterfully use metaphor and symbolism. These poems invite us into an experience to ponder ideas slowly and from many angles. And the largest collection of poetry in the Bible is the book of Psalms. So that's what we're going to look at here. Now, the Israelites composed lots of poetry throughout their history. Yeah, poems were written by Israelite sages, kings, and prophets. Some poems were sung by choirs in the Jerusalem temple, while others were prayed by families at home. And over the centuries, the most important and widely read poems were compiled together to be read or sung on special occasions. And I'm familiar with books of poetry, a large collection of the greatest poems in one place, and I can read through and pick my favorites. But the Book of Psalms isn't that kind of collection. Here, each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is for a reason, to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. The Psalms poetically retell the entire biblical story, and they invite you into a literary temple. A literary temple? Yeah, so the tabernacle and then later the temple in Jerusalem were where ancient Israelites went to meet with God. When you arrived, you would see art and imagery everywhere. You'd see priests performing rituals. You'd hear songs and prayers, all of it symbolically proclaiming that your God rules the world from this mountain and you're in his living room. So the temple was a place to be in God's presence and also to immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom. Exactly. 
And so try to imagine how traumatic it was when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, plundered and burned the temple, and then took many Israelites into exile. Yeah, where can they go now to meet with God, to sing their story and say their prayers? That's where the book of Psalms comes in. It's a prayer book for exiles designed as a virtual temple. You enter the Psalms to meet with God and to hear the entire biblical story of God's kingdom sung back to you in poetry. Cool, but how does the Psalms do it? Let's start with the book's design. There are 150 poems broken up into five clear sections. At the beginning, there's been placed a short introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which lay out the main themes of the whole book by reviewing the biblical storyline. Okay. Psalm 1 looks back to the Garden of Eden and its river of life. Yeah, God placed humanity in a garden temple. And here, humans decide to define good and evil on their own terms and so are exiled from the garden. But the first psalm paints a portrait of hope about an upright human who delights in God's wisdom, which is called Torah or instruction. This person is like the tree of life in the garden temple. They eternally blossom because they're planted in the river of God's life. Yeah, that's beautiful. But who's it supposed to be? Well, remember that story in Genesis. After humanity's foolish rebellion, God made a promise. Oh, right. A future human, the seed of the woman who would come and defeat evil and restore the world. And that's what Psalm 2 is about. God's promise that a king would come from the line of David. He's called the Son of God and the Messiah. God appoints him to bring justice on human evil and to restore God's kingdom and peace over the nations. So Psalms 1 and 2 introduce all these main themes. Yes, and then the book develops those themes through the five sections. The first two explore the complicated story of David and his royal family. The third section focuses on the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's royal line. But then the fourth and fifth sections rekindle the hope for the Messiah, a new temple, and God's kingdom on the other side of the exile. Then the book ends with a five-part conclusion, praising God for his faithfulness. Cool. Now, nearly half of the Psalms are connected to one guy, King David, who God chose to rule Israel. Yes, David's story is really important in this book. He experienced many times of hardship, but he trusted God with radical faith. And in these poems, David shares his fears, confesses his failures, and offers thanks to his Redeemer. And he's constantly speaking of a deep longing to be in God's presence in the temple. But wait, David lived before the temple was even built. Exactly. This portrait of David, hoping and praying for God's kingdom and a future temple, it resembles the hopes of the later generations of the exiles. And so David's prayers could become theirs as well. David's like a prayer coach, giving us words for how to pray and how to discover God's presence in good times and bad. Exactly. There are 73 poems connected to David, but most of the rest come from later generations of biblical poets, and they have learned to pray and hope like David. And so the end result is the book of Psalms, designed as a virtual temple for all generations of God's people. This isn't a kind of book you just read once and put down. No, it's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflection. These prayers and laments and songs of praise are meant to become our own. They're poems for exiles who are learning to live by God's wisdom and to seek God's justice in the world as they hope for the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God. Okay, well, I hope you all enjoyed that video. Um, one of the things that have been especially, uh, w one of the ideas that has been especially meaningful for me comes uh, from a contemporary uh, author and pastor uh, of Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, uh, a man whom I've read um, much of his writings. Uh, his name is Tim Keller, and he talks about the Psalms in the following way. He says, the Psalms are not just a matchless primer of teaching, although they are that. They are a medicine chest for the heart. Isn't that a great quote? The Psalms are not just a matchless primer of teaching. They are a medicine chest for the heart. I love that. Again, I mentioned that sometimes for some of us, church is often the last place that we want to go to when things seem to be falling apart. I know for others of us, church might be the first place we want to go. And 
Yet the Psalms have always been central to the life of Christian worship historically, but also Jewish worship out of which we have been born. Uh, And that's because the Psalms speak to the fullness of the human experience, positioning that experience at the feet of God, at the feet of the one who is our creator and our maker, who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so I hope that uh, as we come together, as we hear the psalms chanted or as we read them, um, that that will inspire you uh, and remind you that you do not have to have your life together to come to church. Quite the opposite. And in fact, I hope uh, whether you feel that your life is together or not, uh, you will find solace in the psalms that you will uh, seek them and find within them the very presence of God mediated through them to you um, or you into his presence so that you might uh, receive the divine medicine that you need for your soul. I want to look at a psalm. Um, Again, this class is called How to Read the Bible, and so it's important that we actually jump into the biblical text. And I want to look at a psalm that is at once beautiful, and terrible. It is Psalm 137, and uh, I want to read it to you just briefly. It goes like this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we, we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then comes the heartbreaking question, How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? That's so beautiful and visceral and human. A people who've been dispossessed, who are no longer in their homes, who are in many ways refugees, who have been conquered, devastated, who have lost sons and daughters, whose villages have been pillaged, whose daughters have been raped, whose sons have been killed in battle. This is the song that generations have sung. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Such a human question. And a deeply visceral question. And so then it continues in verse 5. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall. How they said, tear it down, tear it down down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. As I mentioned a moment ago, what a beautiful and a terrible psalm. How are we to make sense of this psalm, Psalm 137? Which raises another question. How are we to deal with anger and rage? With the anger of having our lives devastated, of things turning out not how we would expect them. And yet, also the rage that might develop. At moments, we might deal with despondency. We might weep. We might be inclined to resignation or despair. But also, a very human response is to pursue violence, to be filled with rage, to be angry. So what are we to do? 
in particular with anger and rage. Well, what I want to suggest to you is that imagine that the Psalms are like a train track, a set of rails upon which our souls ride towards the end goal of being fully human. The question for us as disciples, as believers in the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as followers of Jesus Christ, the fullest, uh, the only incarnation and fullest expression of that God, how are we to express our very human emotions, which at points we have no control over? Anger, rage, weeping, sorrow, depression, despair, resignation, and more. Well, I think that the Psalms are actually a tutor for us to learn how to become fully human, to not see our emotions as infections of the soul, to not see our emotions as somehow a sign of weakness, but actually the Psalms help us name our emotions and what we're going through. It actually, the Psalter helps to form us in emotional health and intelligence. I've mentioned before uh, in another context that when our child or when a loved one or a friend is hurt, they fall and they break their arm, they know how to point out the problem. They know how to name it. They can point to their arm and say, this hurts. I think something's broken. But in the human experience, it's often not as easy to point to ourselves and within our souls and say, this is what's going on. I'm afflicted with rage. This is what's going on. I'm overwhelmed with despair or depression. We haven't, some of us at least, developed the vocabulary and the ability, the capacity, really, to clearly articulate what is going on within the travails of our souls in moments of difficulty. Again, the Psalms are like a literary professor helping us to name those things, those experiences, but then to entrust them into the hands of the only God who can save us, who can heal us, who can lead us through the valley as the good shepherd. So in this psalm, we see the depth of despair and loss, but we see anger. And you might remember that earlier on in our class, we talked about the distinction between descriptive reading versus uh, prescriptive reading. What I would suggest here in this text that we might be rightly horrified by this is not prescriptive language. God in this psalm is not somehow justifying uh, smashing babies' heads against rocks. Rather, what we are hearing is the psalmist's voice crying out from the midst of difficult experiences. So this is not prescriptive. It's descriptive of the human experience. And then entrusting that placing that in the presence of God, trusting God to do what he will. So, in other words, the Psalms are teaching us to express anger appropriately and along with other emotions. Aristotle, for instance, said the following, anyone can become angry. That is easy, but to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way, well, that is not easy. It's not easy at all. Such a great quote. So Aristotle recognized that becoming angry, well, that's just part of the human experience. But how do we steward anger? Again, anger does not mean that we're somehow broken. It means that we're human. And into, uh, you know, the, 
into the same spot as anger, we could insert all kinds of emotions. In other words, the Psalms, as I've said before, are helping us to become fully human. Ellen Davis, a great scholar, has written the following about the Psalms. She says, the Psalms enable us to bring into our conversation with God feelings and thoughts most of us think we need to get rid of before God will be interested in hearing from us. Such a great quote. As if God <laughs> can't handle what he already knows about us. God knows everything that is going on within our hearts. And in fact, he knows more. We feel as if we need to get rid of some of these feelings before we come into the presence of God, right? I mean, think about just the very human experience of uh, driving to church as a child and maybe your mom or dad yelled at you and then you all pull up to the front door and you kind of tidy up and you walk in as, this, as if it's business as usual. Well, I mean, to some degree, we have to do that, right? Um, and yet, and yet, that speaks to the way in which we feel like we need to flush those experiences kind of down the drain as if that's somehow not uh, that's not okay to bring those sorts of emotions into the presence of God. So I would say or suggest that Psalm 137 is a kind of case study for how we experience and steward rage appropriately. So here's a, a, a great quote. Um, goes like this. Rage belongs before God, not in the reflectively managed and manicured form of a confession, but as a pre-reflective outburst from the depths of the soul. By placing unattended rage before God, we place both our unjust enemy and our own vengeful self face to face with a God who loves and does justice. And the quote continues. Hidden in the dark chambers of our hearts, and nourished by the system of darkness, hate grows and seeks to infest everything with its hellish will to exclusion. In the light of the justice and love of God, however, hate recedes and the seed is planted for the miracle of forgiveness. And then this extended quote concludes on the next slide with the following. It's not safe, simply bottled up, in my own heart. It's not safe in some public space of venting our collective feelings. It is safe in the space where it is placed before the one God of both those whose children have been dashed against the rocks and of those who did the dashing of those children against the rocks. Such a profound and powerful quote. God, who is the God of all, who created all and made all, even if many of us do not recognize his, his sovereignty over creation. Um, when we come into his midst, when we have been violated, and we express whatever it is that we are feeling in his presence, that God, the God who is our God, and the God of the one who was our violator, he is the one who will know what to do how to bring healing into our hearts, our lives, and our souls, into the souls of those in our family, our friends, our neighbors, those who are suffering. We place these experiences at the feet of God. Again, whether it's an experience of rage in this sort of case study of Psalm 137 or any other human emotion, the Psalms teach us, tutor us, the Psalms function as a kind of set of railroad tracks that lead us ultimately to God, that help us become fully human, that take us somewhere. The Psalms are tracks upon which our own emotions can move in a healthy and in a directed way. Okay, so that's a bit about the Psalms. Um, I want to speak to the question of well, are the Psalms poetry or history or both? So you might remember several weeks back in our class on how to read the Bible, 
I put up this painting by Rene Magritte. Uh, and um, the painting is a, a picture of a pipe. And cesse un pa un peep. This is not a pipe. Was the statement is the statement under this famous painting by Magritte. And he was being quite uh, provocative in all sorts of ways. I don't want to rehash um, everything that we said about that. But the point is that I use that as a way of talking about how there is perspective within the biblical uh, canon, within the scriptures. There are certain impressions that are being presented to us. Uh, the authors actually have a point. There is meaning or meanings within a text that we are intended to receive. Uh, there is significance which we are intended to glean from the text. So think, for instance, about uh, a stenographer in a courtroom, right? The stenographer records events as they are described, but the records are not the event itself, but rather a representation, a representation of the event or the events. So what you have is not the event itself, but a written representation or representing of the event or events. Or we might think about a painting of a key witness, right? It is a different image intentionally constructed, but it is an image. It is not the witness himself or herself. It is a painting. Similarly, the Bible is literature. Uh, this does not mean that it's not true. It is the source of all truth because it is rooted in Christ himself, who is the way, the truth, and the life. But as literature, it is representing things to us in a particular light. So I would suggest that the Psalms, well, they are poetry that are rooted within history that ultimately tell a true story. <laughs> More could be said about that. But I want to press into the question of, uh, the question that some might ask after dealing with this is, well, then are the biblical narratives true or not? Let me speak to that just a bit. When we ask, are the biblical narratives true, we have to ask, well, what do we mean by that question? Are we asking, do they communicate something that is true to the human experience? That would be one possibility. Do we mean that um, the biblical narratives are making a true claim about God and God's purposes in the world? Are we saying they are true in a sense of historical reference? That is, they are naming events that really happened? Well, simply put, I think that there's a little bit of all of this going on here. The biblical authors must be taken, however, on their own terms. They weren't just concerned to give us camera footage of events. They're not giving us a telephone book with just information to be used. It's literature to be received as a gift of literature. That is, they weren't just concerned to tell us hey, this event happened, but rather this event happened and here is the significance for you as a reader. That's really what the authors were getting at. But before we, uh, again, can answer the question of are the biblical narratives true, which, by the way, I think they are true, <laughs> we have to also address the question of are they true literally or metaphorically or ask more deeply, is that even a faithful way of framing the question itself? Is that the best way of asking the question with respect to truth? As if literal and metaphorical are pitted somehow against one another in competition. Well, I want to show you a video. And this is a video 
that features a, uh, a great Anglican bishop and scholar named uh, N.T. Wright, or some call him Tom Wright. He has written many, many volumes, uh, both on the academic and scholarly level and on the more popular level. And he's been influential in my own story. I don't agree with everything that he's written or said, but he talks here about uh, the word literal and the word metaphorical, and he makes some really helpful distinctions that I think are important for the purposes of our own conversation. So I'm going to play this video, and then we'll uh, wrap up our conversation for today. Hi, I'm Dr. Peter Enns. I'm Senior Fellow in Biblical Studies at the BioLogos Foundation. And we're here today with uh, the Reverend Dr. Tom Wright. And we have a chance to ask some questions, some of which we've gotten uh, via Twitter and emails. Uh, and also about a lot of topics such as his recent book, After You Believe, and uh, science and faith issues. So uh, welcome, Tom. Uh, Thank you. Good, good to, to see you again. You. Now into sort of science and faith discussion specifically, and, and, and there are many questions about this. But one question is, if you take Genesis in a non-literal fashion, especially the creation stories, um, why take anything in the Bible literally, like, say, the Gospels? Hmm. Do you take the Gospels literally? Um, I want to say that the word literal is confusing. The word literal, like the word metaphorical, is actually a word which refers to the way that words refer to things, whereas what we often mean is the dis distinction between concrete and abstract, concrete being something definite, physical, substantial, abstract being like an idea. Now, you can refer metaphorically to something concrete, if I call my car the old tin can, that's a metaphorical reference to something that is definitely solid, or you can refer literally to something abstract. If I say Plato's theory of forms, that theory is itself an abstraction, and the forms are themselves abstract and doubly abstract, but I'm referring literally to it. So when we say, is Genesis to be taken literally, um, what I want to say is, that doesn't settle ahead of time the question of what it actually refers to. And when we are reading any text, it ought to be an open question. What does this text intend to refer to, and how does it intend to refer to it? And famously, when you read the, in the Gospels, um, Jesus saying there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one took the cash and ran, and then came back, etc., etc. It, it makes no sense for a reader of the Gospels to say, I need to know where this farm was. I want to know what the name of that father was. Can I go and visit him? Or could you have done at the time? That's just uh, Jesus himself and his first hearers would have said, don't be silly. That's a parable. So I want to say that you've got to go case by case. When it says Jesus was crucified, it really means Jesus was crucified. That isn't a subtle metaphor for something else. But when Jesus himself tells a parable, um, the point is not that this actually happened somewhere and we're drawing lessons from it. The point is this is a cheerfully fictitious story, but often the real meaning remains concrete. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe even if one should rise from the dead. And the concrete application of that is, if you've got a poor man covered in sores by your gate, you ought to be looking after him. So it's a much more interesting and complicated question than your culture and mine has ever allowed us to get into by this literal, non-literal split. So when you go back to Genesis with all of that, I really want to know what did the writer of Genesis, or the people who wrote the bits and pieces which came together as Genesis, what did they intend to do by this story? And as we know from various people, telling a story about somebody who constructs something in six days, it's a temple story. It's about um, God making a place for himself to dwell. And this is heaven and earth. And what you do with that is the last thing is you put an image of the God into this temple. And suddenly, Genesis 1, instead of it being were there six days or were there five or were there seven or were there 24 hours, it's actually about God making heavens and the earth as the place where he wants to dwell and putting humans into that construct as a way of both reflecting his own love into the world and drawing out the praise and glory from the world back to himself. And that's the literal meaning of Genesis. And the question of the, of the formal structure has to sit around that as best it can.
All right. Well, I hope that you all enjoyed that video. And um, N.T. Wright is, is certainly, uh, you know, much more capable and um, far more intelligent than than I am. And so I, I trust that he was able to offer some clarity and comprehension around uh, the question of do we take the Bible literally or metaphorically? And um, and I, I found it to be very helpful, but I would be interested to hear your thoughts. Feel free to share those with me at some point. But I simply want to I want to emerge from having watched that video with the question of uh, what did the author or, or the authors intend uh, to, to do with the story that we are coming across, right? That's really the question that we need to ask as we're dealing with literature. So the question is not how do we interpret the Bible literally at all moments. It's rather how do we interpret the Bible literarily according to its correct genre but also in accordance to how it functions in salvation history and how it functions under the revelation of Christ as a figure of Christ, as pointing to Christ. So again, we start with the question of what did the author or authors intend to do with this story, uh, but what meaning and significance as well did the author or authors uh, want us to receive? And most importantly, uh, what meaning and significance did the divine author want us to receive? And so those are really the questions that are most important to us for how to read the Bible. So um, we have to ask then, what is the literary form of the text? That's actually really where we begin. We have to ask, is it narrative or poetry or prophecy? Is it an epistle? Is it a letter? Right? You're going to read a letter quite differently than you would read poetry. If I'm opening up someone's mail, reading a letter written from one person to another, uh, I'm going to have to employ a different set of reading skills than if I were reading poetry or if I were reading a history book. Right? Are we reading a gospel, uh, some form of narrative? And of course, many of these genres overlap with others. So are we reading uh, apocalyptic literature? Um, and you'll be hearing more about apocalyptic literature. Uh, but that is its own genre, which demands of us to understand the text on its own term and to understand that when the Bible uses vivid imagery, it's not saying that this is literally what will happen per se, but rather it's speaking to some deeper truth or mystery about how God will work or is working within creation. We have to read the text both backwards and forwards. So if we're reading Psalm 137, uh, we should look at what came before and after. If we're reading in the middle of the book of Daniel, then we should also go back and reference what came before if we're looking for the meaning of a passage and then see, well, what comes of it, actually. Another way of saying this is that you have to read within context, right? And then we have to ask what metaphors or poetic images are driving the text, standing behind the text, uh, or subtly underneath or within the text. And perhaps most importantly, we have to take time to meditate. Remember Psalm 1, and the ideal Bible reader, the one who chews on the law, the Torah, the, the scripture, uh, the word of God, who meditates on it. You're not reading this just to get information or devotional aids. You're reading it to encounter no one less than the, very, the living God, the God who created the cosmos. And that is the relationship that is mediated to us through this text. So sit with it. Meditate upon it, just as you would meditate on uh, a love letter written from your lover. And then you have to see the Bible as a unified whole, all pointing to Jesus. Remember the account of Luke 24 and the Emmaus Road. Jesus himself gives us permission to interpret all of Scripture in light of who he is, that ultimately it is all hinged upon his cross and resurrection 
and that it is rooted in who he is and how he is working throughout salvation history in obedience to the Father and in the power of the Spirit. So finally, this is uh, the end, we might say, or really only the beginning, (laughs) because it's my hope that you will dive into Scripture. There's a lot that we've not touched on. For instance, we really didn't spend as much time in the New Testament. I was intentional to spend more time in the Old Testament because very often in the church, even in the Episcopal Church, perhaps especially in the Episcopal Church, it's easy for us to think that the Old Testament is the story of another God and thank God Jesus came to save us from that. No, the Old Testament is is not the story of a different God. The entirety of Scripture is the entirety of, 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 of God's revelation to us um, through the biblical canon and we have to treat it equally and so what i would say is that in the future i want to dive more into the new testament stay tuned on future offerings but we will dive more into the gospels into the epistles into the parables and other forms of apocalyptic literature but simply put i hope that this class has been helpful for you and learning how to read the Bible. Remember, it's one unified story written across generations by God's providence through the work of human authors, and it would take a lifetime and more for us to fully enter into the story and to really comprehend what's going on. In fact, because it has God's infinite wisdom at its source, we will never exhaust the glory and the riches of Holy Scripture. So spend time with it, and I hope that you are encouraged in your faith, you are deepened in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and you are equipped to be his hands and feet in the world, to be the body of Christ. So blessings on you. Stay tuned for more offerings in the future. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.